Vakar visiem, kas ir pie vienā šešokar, var droši ieslēgt savas kameras, tie, kas jūtas komfortabli ar to, tie, kas ne, ne, bet, bet es servi ir aizvadīta ļoti produktīvam un foršo nedēļam, kam bija laba nedēļa. Ļoti labi, ļoti labi es redzu, mēs. Bet man ir ļoti, ļoti liels prieks redzēt jūs visus šeit piekdienas vakarā. Manuprāt, tā ir ļoti, ļoti laba izvēle un daudz labāk nekā būt Netflixā šajā vakarā. Un jā, tiem, kas vēl mani nezin, mani salc Laura Grīgista. Es esmu medicīnas students stradiņos un kopā ar citiem studentiem vasaras laikā dodos uz Amerikas rādā. Bet man ir arī tas gods vadīt, ko nemāca skolā lekcijas, kas jau kādreiz ir bijis uz vienu no lekcijām. Jē, mēs, ļoti labi. Bet tie, kas nezin, tad tā ir lekciju sērija, kur tiks aicināti veiksmīgi cilvēki no visas pasaules, kas dalīsies ar savām zināšanām, ko parasti skolā ne visu laiku māca. Un tiem, kam vēl nav, Sagatavojat klades, pilspalvas, jo šodien būs ļoti, ļoti daudz labu ideju. Un jā, tā ir mūsu Facebook lapusam, jūtieties droši piesakot, lai būtu updated. Bet šodien jūs dzirdēsiet ne tikai krievu akcentu, tas ir labi, jo mūsu viesis ir no Amerikas. Tāpēc es runāšu angļu valodā. Bet, Dan, are you here? I am right here, Laura. Yes, good. That's awesome. And um, I have this honor to introduce our speaker, Dan Moore. Many of you already know who is that, but uh, Dan Moore grew up in uh, northern New Mexico and he attended Harvard University where he graduated with honors at age 20 and one year before he was supposed to. <laughs> And uh, he started in the business world the same way tens of thousands of others as a college student running his own business with the Southwestern Advantage company. And uh, he paid his Harvard tuition by selling Southwestern Advantage products door to door and building uh, sales teams. He was named the uh, president in 2007 and from student intern to president, he has never worked anywhere else. In all, he trained more than 100,000 people how to sell, how to lead, and how to get on the path toward achieving their goals in life. He is also the host of a TEDx Nashville, which has more than 1,500 audience members. Just imagine. <laughs> and uh, he has completed 24 half marathons since the age of 51, and also completed the New York City Marathon when he was 56 finishing in the top half of 46,000 runners. He and his wife, Maria, have been married for 43 years. They have three adult children and one granddaughter, who everyone knows is the most beautiful child in the world. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> and um, from my side, I, I can tell that uh, when you talk to them, you think he's looking in your eyes, but what he really does, he looks in your heart. And uh, thank you for helping people feel uh, respected, valued, and uh, appreciated. Thank you so much, Dan. And the uh, stage is yours. Paldies, Laura. Labas vakaras. Labas vakar. So good to see so many great friends on this slide and some people I don't even know yet. It's wonderful to be with you. If only I could be there in Riga. It's better for you that I'm on video though, because you can always turn it off anytime you want to. Hopefully you won't do that too much and we'll have a good time tonight. So thank all of you for being here. I know it's a Friday night and you're wondering, this is my background, all those question marks, you're wondering why in the world are you here? Well, we hope you're here to have some fun. We hope you're here to laugh a little 
We we'll hope you're here to get some ideas and most of all to start thinking. So I'm very proud of all of you and glad that you're here. If I can borrow the screen for just a moment, we'll rock right into this presentation and hopefully you'll have some fun with it, which would be good fun for me too. First of all, we're gonna say welcome once again and to ask you a question. How many of you have never been to Nashville, Tennessee? I can see some of your hands, never been to Nashville, okay. Well, Nashville, I learned a long time ago, has its own unique language. It's not actually English, it's a version called Nashville. So if it's okay with you, we're gonna start with a lesson on how to speak Nashville. So you down, everybody excited, ready to go? Okay, cool. So first of all, how would you say the word on the screen? In your group, say that word out loud. Right, cheer. Well, in Nashville, this is a cheer. <laughs> and so if somebody says, how's your cheer? You shouldn't go, yeah, say, oh, it's pretty comfortable, I'm all right. Now we get a little bit older in school and we start learning about grammar. Most of you speak excellent English. So you know that the second person pronoun in the singular is you, that's the singular. One, I, I am I, you are you. So you may wonder what is the singular in Nashville? It's pretty simple, it is y'all. Now, the first time I went to Nashville, I was amazed because I was in a room alone by myself, no one else there. And a guy walked in the room and said, hi, how y'all doing? And I looked around behind me and there's no all, <laughs> it was just me. So how do you answer the question, how are y'all doing when you're alone? So I said, well, I all is fine. Wait, sorry, that didn't say, I all are, are fine. I, oh, well, never mind. I'm fine. So anyway, if that is the singular, any guesses on how you make the plural? More than one you. Now, somebody's saying it's y'alls. It's not y'alls. Instead, you just put another all in front of it. All y'all. So let me ask you again, how all y'all doing tonight? Kind of crazy language, but a little bit of fun. Now, as Lauder said, I'm from New Mexico and I'm from a little town called Los Alamos, New Mexico. Most people have never heard of Los Alamos, but somebody in the room that studies physics might've heard of Los Alamos because my hometown had one main industry and that industry was building nuclear bombs. Oh yeah, our hometown was created in 1942 to develop the Manhattan Project and a working thermonuclear weapon. That's where I grew up. My dad worked on weapons, but I didn't know exactly how. Most people's dad or mom worked on weapons. I didn't know exactly what they did, but it was an interesting place to grow up. So here's a question for you. If your hometown had five nuclear reactors, because that's how many we had, and you knew they made bombs of radioactive material, and also this was the Cold War and the Soviet Union had you on their top 10 hit list, hmm, what would be your dream? when you became 18 and independent. That's right, to get out of there as far and as fast away as you can go. So that's what I did. And I found out that Harvard was very far away in a place called Boston or Cambridge, Massachusetts. So when I applied to Harvard, I was kind of surprised when they let me in. What was even more shocking was the cost was ridiculous. And I realized when I saw the cost of going to Harvard that I had made one big mistake when I was a baby. I forgot something. I forgot to be born in a rich family. <laughs> I mean, I had very cool parents, but they were not exactly rich material. So my dad was a big supporter of mine. So he got out something called a typewriter. Now, I know you have no idea what a typewriter is. My dad got out a typewriter and he said, dear Harvard, please send money. And he sent it away. And about 10 days later, something returned. And that something was a letter. Now, if you go down to the museum, you can probably find letters. I know they're kind of unusual. And it said, dear Roger, we really would like Dan to come to Harvard. So we're gonna help him with some financial assistance, some financial assistance. First thing we're going to do is we're going to give him a very small scholarship. Now, Roger, I have to tell you, it will be really, really small, but possibly Dan will take a lecture in biology here and then he'll be able to use our powerful electron microscope and he'll be able to see his scholarship because he can see even small things like the amount of money we're going to give him. But then guess what, Roger? Harvard is like a bank. 
So we're going to lend him a lot of money. In fact, we're going to lend him so much money that Dan and then his children and then the children of his children will all enjoy paying it back over the course of all of their lives. It'll be awesome. And then because this is a really expensive town, we're going to then give Dan a part-time job that will be very cool. It'll be totally amazing. And he'll be right here working on the Harvard University campus. It'll be great. So I said, I'm sold. I'm going to go. So I showed up in Boston, went to the Harvard campus, and my very first visit was to the student employment office. So I was having a lot of fun being at Harvard, but I needed my part-time job. So I said, okay, I'm hit this beautiful place. What's my part-time job going to be? The guy there was had a list of names and he tried to find my name and said, what's your name? I said, oh, my name, it's, it's Moore. So yeah, Moore, 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 Moore. I said, no, no, not Moore, Moore. Yeah, yeah, hey, you more, more, more. I said, no, 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 no. M O O R E. Yeah, more. I heard you. Hey, more. Where did you park your car? Uh, what? I said, what? Y your car. Where did you park your car? More, you better not park your car in the Harvard yard. They'll tow your car. And I said, oh my gosh, he is very abrupt and there's no R's <laughs> in Boston. So then he said, okay, I found your name, more. You need a uniform for your job. I figured out that meant a uniform. So my dad, my, my boss threw this white jacket at me. Now the white jacket looked like a lab coat. And I said, this is so great. I'll be in the laboratory next to some famous scientist. This would be way cool. But then it went the other direction. My next item of clothing was a net for my hair. This was way back in the 1970s and I had a lot of hair. And then finally my name badge said assistant dishwasher. <laughs> oh yeah, assistant dishwasher. Now, possibly some of you have eaten in a cafeteria before. And when you finish the cafeteria, you have your food on the tray and you carry it over to this place where it goes away behind a wall. And probably you at that moment, just continue on with your life, don't you? <laughs> you never even think who lives or works behind the wall. That's where the assistant dishwasher works. And it was in that dormitory that another student told me about Southwestern Advantage. That's how this whole thing got started. Now it was an interesting dormitory, it's called Kirkland House. And about 30 years later, a man named Mark Zuckerberg started his business in Kirkland House too. So it was an interesting place for entrepreneurship. And that was how I got started in college and how I first started working with students. So anyway, we're here tonight with lots of questions. You probably noticed my background, lots of questions. And you're wondering, how can I be certain of a future that is full of questions? We're gonna take a quick look at where we are today. This smiling face is you. You look pretty cool, don't you? Probably you've been at Yurmala on the beach collecting a lot of sun. You're a little bit red, a little bit burnt. But most of you are physically somewhere in Latvia. You're behind a screen, you're on your phone, you're someplace. The question is, in 10 years time, where will you be then? Hmm. Some of you may still be in Riga. Some of you may have really become highly successful and you move to Volga. I mean, who knows where you might be at that point in time. Some of you will be in other countries. Another question though, is where will you be in 20 years time? But first of all, how old will most of you be by then? Oh yeah, that's right. Most of you are gonna be older than 40. And right now you're having a panic attack. Oh, older than 40, that's ridiculous. It's hard for you to imagine being 40 years old, but one day you will be. What about when you're 50? You may be in Latvia, you may be somewhere in Europe, you may be somewhere, in fact, you may not even be on the planet Earth by that point. You may be far, far away, but don't worry about it. If we can bring Matt Damon all the way back from Mars, we can bring you all the way back from Mars too. The whole point of it is, this is a little formula, a little expression that will explain the future perfectly. Now there's some people in the audience that study physics. And so they're gonna tell you that the letter C represents the speed of light in a vacuum, but it also represents a constant, something that never changes. What does Delta represent? Delta represents change. So what is this formula telling us? It's telling us constant thing will be change, constant change, which means the only thing we can depend on is we probably can't depend on anything being the same. Let's talk about some ways that that's true. 
It's interesting working with young people. Most of you were born into what we call the digital universe. You're young enough that your parents said, welcome to the world. Here is your first connected device. In other words, you have never known a world without connected devices. People that study this stuff say that the amount of data storage in the world is actually doubling every 14 months. That means 62% per year growth in the number of bits and bytes and megabytes and terabytes and gigabytes all stored in these servers that we sometimes call, collectively call the cloud. So let me ask you a simple example. How many of you have got a phone that will take pictures? Let me see, let me see your hand. You have a phone that will take, oh you, oh, you do. Okay, now that's kind of, kind of weird, isn't it? You're saying, uh, Dan, excuse me, man. You just asked me if my phone would take pictures. Yeah, it sounds crazy for you to think that way, but what if I was a time traveler from the 1970s? In fact, I have news for you. I am a time traveler from the 1970s. All right, and suddenly I were to land in Latvia and I go, whoa, whoa, where am I? And you said, uh, well, welcome to Latvia. And I'd say, no way, cool, what year is it? And you said, uh, 2021, why? Oh man, it's a, well, where, what year are you from, sir? Me? Whoa, I'm from the 1970s. And you'd say, far out, you're from the 70s. Whoa, man, can I take a picture of you with my phone? Now, if you said to someone from the 70s, a picture with your phone, I'd probably be insulted and say, yeah, right. Next, you're gonna call me on your camera. There's a picture that can take, it's crazy. But anyway, all of you have one of these little things. So how many of you ever back up some of your images? Do you, you know, to the cloud? Who thinks they have at least a thousand images backed up to the cloud somewhere? Yeah, I know there's at least two people on this call that have a thousand images of their dessert from yesterday that they had to save because they're so beautiful, backed up to the cloud. So let's say we have uh, oh, about 75 people in this seminar. Actually is 101 participants. So if each person had a thousand images backed up to the cloud, that would be 100,000 images floating above you somewhere up there. If we took everybody in the world that has a phone that can take pictures, that's about 3 billion people, believe it or not. Each one backed up only 1,000 images. That is 3 trillion images floating around in the cloud, which means if the wind is just exactly right, it'll soon begin raining. Selfies from out of the cloud all over us. And this is only still pictures. Videos take even more storage. In fact, how many of you have at least one friend who spends a little bit of time in what's called YouTube? Yeah, nobody in this meeting, of course, you're all too professional, but you all know that friend that spends a lot of time in YouTube. YouTube's own statistics say that the amount of content uploaded in one minute on YouTube, around the one minute, would require a single person a thousand years to watch. Who could do it? Nobody, but you all know that one guy who's going to die trying. So the digital universe, nobody can actually catalog it correctly or keep up with the amount of information there, and it's going to just get worse. We live in a constantly changing world in terms of politics and ge geopolitics. In fact, since 1990, 34 new nations have appeared on the earth. You are living in one of them. For a long time, you weren't your own nation. You were considered part of the Soviet Union. But because of the changes in the world, we have opportunities that our families didn't have and that others didn't have, and it is continuing to change rapidly. We don't know what's going to happen next. We don't know if somebody's going to take over another landmass, create a continent. Who knows what will happen, but the world's changing quickly. I spent a lot of time in England. Some people in this call have spent time in England. And in 2020, it was kind of cool to be in England because it was part of Europe. But by 2021, England had gone far, far, far away, and somehow it was no longer part of Europe. And this mess is continuing today. Who knows where it's gonna end up? Some of you study business and in business itself, companies can have a tremendously strong position, but if they're not careful, they can lose their position. I don't know if anyone in this meeting has ever heard of a company called Netscape. Some of you think, oh uh, yeah, Dan, I think I heard of it. What do they do? I don't know, I just think I heard of it. Okay, Netscape was the developer of the very first commercially successful internet browser for private people. The first web browser came from Netscape called Navigator. It was unbelievable device. What that meant was that people like you and me could turn on our computers, 
wait seven minutes for the computer to boot up, power up Netscape Navigator, and in a couple of clicks, we could learn what the weather is outside. Now, before that, we had to open the window to see what the weather is outside, but anyway, it was pretty incredible. It was such an amazing product that they had 92% share of the market. When I introduced my family to the World Wide Web, it was with Netscape Navigator. But let me see your hands if you do not surf the web with Netscape Navigator. Well, of course you don't because they're out of business. 92% market share, and now they are gone. Instead, you go on the web with Safari or Google Chrome. There might be one silent person in the room that uses Internet Explorer. But anyway, most other people use other things because Netscape is gone. Everybody knows what this company is. And five years ago, Volkswagen was named the most successful automotive company in history. Highly respected, lots of cars, very profitable. And then some people here know what they did. They were caught cheating and lying about pollution controls. They were so intelligent, they engineered the cars so that they behaved differently when they were being tested for pollution than they did on the highway. <laughs> and they got caught. CEO lost his job. The fines and penalties are more than $30 billion. Their market share dropped like crazy. Their popularity went down. So the greatest company in the world suddenly isn't so great anymore. Some of you may remember as children saying to your dad or mom, let's go to Blockbuster. Can't say that anymore, can we? Interestingly enough, Blockbuster had the opportunity to buy a small startup called Netflix. And they said, nah, we don't want it. We don't want it. It's pretty incredible how that happens. In the US, people used to buy all their appliances at Circuit City. Circuit City is gone. Really hard, hard to predict. And whole industries can actually disappear. I don't know if anybody in this room even knows what this device is, but I gave this presentation at Vanderbilt University about two months ago, and a student in the back of the room raised his hand and said, uh, yes, sir, Mr. Moore, I know what it is. I said, well, what is it? He said, when you go buy some shoes in the shoe store, you put your foot down and they measure your foot. <laughs> and I had to say, uh, no, good guess. What you're looking at is called a slide rule. And a slide rule is a calculating device. A calculating device. Louder, can you guys see this on my little image here? This calculating device is incredibly powerful and strong. You can do many kinds of mathematics. You can do square roots, cube roots, you can do all the logarithm functions, you can do natural and exponentials, you can do all the trigonometric functions simply by sliding the middle piece out, matching up the scale and reading off the answer. Slide rule. And what you're looking at was my graduation present from high school from my mother and father. You probably didn't notice when I pulled it out, but it comes in an amazingly beautiful leather case. And on the back of the leather case, there is a small metal loop. And that metal loop attaches to someone's belt. And you're thinking, no, Dan, you didn't. Yes, I did. <laughs> I walked on that campus so hard wearing my slide rule. I said, hey, yo, guys, let's have slide rule races. It was ridiculous. But that's the way people calculated when I was your age. And now you think, huh. So what about all the people that were in the industry of manufacturing slide rules? Things change very quickly in business sometimes. So what this means is that planning for a career is very, very difficult. Most of you are in your early 20s. By the time you're in your 40s, many jobs will be in industries that do not currently exist. So how do you study for something that doesn't even exist? I don't know but we're gonna talk a little bit about some things we can do. You may be wondering with all these changes in politics and governments and business, what in the world can you do? What can you personally, a student do? Well, I got two ideas for you. First of all, drink heavily, <laughs> but the next day the problem will still be there and you won't feel better. Instead, I'm gonna recommend something more constructive and that is get to know what we call the CIA. Now, this is not the CIA spy agency you're thinking of. They already know everything about you. You notice the letters FN, C, I, and A is a very simple way to sort out the things that life throws at us. C stands for things that we can personally control. So most of you might be taking notes. 
Think for just a minute. What is one thing every day you can completely and absolutely control? I don't know what you wrote down, but some of the things we can control are things like what time we go to bed at night. We might think, oh, I just need to watch one more episode, but we can actually control what time we go to bed at night. We can control what time we get up in the morning, not at what time we get up, but how we get up. Most of your phones have got this snooze function and many people use the snooze to great expertise and never actually get out of bed in the morning. We can control how hard we work. We can control what we eat, what we drink, how much of those things we do. Can we control what we say to other people? Yeah, we can. Can we control what they say to us? No, not at all. Now, can we control other people? This is a really important question. The answer is, mm -mm. We, we might think we can. I mean, if you're big and strong and the person you're trying to control is small and you can hold their neck really tightly, but have you ever noticed little people are very slippery and they get away and they go, it's just, it's just not any fun to try to control somebody. So the number of things that we can control is small, vitally important, but small. There are more things in this world that we can't really control, but we can in fact influence. And the two things I wanna chat about right now, first of all, we can learn to influence other people. Other human beings can be influenced by us and what we do. We influence our friends. If a friend walks to you and says, hey, how you doing? We say, don't ask, man. Well, we influence our friend. If we see a friend that looks discouraged and we say, hey, you look a little bit discouraged. Can I help with that? We influence them for good. Do you influence your professors, teachers, and lecturers? Oh yeah, you do. I promise you do. If you come early so you can sit in the back and if all you do is watch videos or take a nap, I promise you will influence your lecturers. But let me give you an idea on how to influence them for the better. When you get to the room, get there early enough to get a seat near the front. Now, I do not recommend the very front row. That's where the nerds and all the geeks sit. But you want to sit in the second row, second row. The second row is awesome because you can have very good eye contact. But part of you still feels kind of cool. You know, cool is really important when you're a student. And in that second row, sit close by, right in the middle. And when your professor is making lectures, take notes like this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yep, got it. In other words, it won't take very long and your professor will be giving you a personalized presentation just to you because you're paying attention, you're listening, it's making sense to you. Everybody else is asleep or watching YouTube. So you can influence your professors. Now, the other really important thing we can all influence is our own attitude. Some of you may have thought you could control your attitude and if you can, bravo to you, I would like to study and learn from you. I used to think I could control my attitude. I really did. And one day, a few years ago, I was driving to work in my car and I was in my lane. I was doing the speed limit. I was obeying all the traffic laws and a young kid in the car behind me hit me. He hit me from behind. He hit my car. And I said, dude, really? You hit my car, man. Can't you even drive? What's wrong? You hit my car. And I was totally lost it. And then I finally realized, oh, shoot. <clears throat> I teach this stuff. <laughs> so even though we think we can control our attitude, sometimes it carries away because we're emotional humans, but we can learn to influence it. Play with a couple, play a couple of games with me first. What I'd like you to do in your chair, most of you are sitting down and I happen to be standing up right now. Most of you are sitting down, try to pretend something really frightening, horrible and monstrous is coming slowly toward you. It's your worst nightmare and get down in your chair and make yourself as small as you can. Just play with me for a second. Just try this. Just get small. Everybody try. You can do this. Nobody can see you except me. Get really small. Oh my gosh. The monster's getting closer, closer, closer. Protect yourself. He's getting closer. Okay, stop. Stop. Come out. Come out. There we go. Good job, Elizabeth. You're hiding very well. Now, you two things happened. First of all, you felt completely like an idiot. <laughs> and that's okay, because nobody could see you. But second... You were only in that position for 10 seconds. And yet, if you'd stayed in that position for two minutes, you would have secreted a measurable amount of something called cortisol. Cortisol is also known as the stress hormone. Too much stress hormone, heart attack, stroke, die young. So thank you very much for playing our game tonight. 
Now, on the other hand, if you want to feel more confident, not more frightened, everybody try this experiment. Just get as large, as huge, as powerful, as grizzly bear, a big old bear. Just get strong, get broad, spread it out. And even say, it's all good. Now you feel even stupider than you did a few minutes ago. But if you had maintained that posture for two minutes, your body would have released a measurable amount of testosterone. Whether for male or female, testosterone makes us feel more confident and more courageous. So next time you're getting ready for an exam, go hide somewhere and just get really big and it'll help you feel better. Have you ever been sad? Yeah, we've all been sad sometimes. Well, if you're sad and you want to feel more sad, it's pretty easy to do. Walk very slowly with your head down and listen to music by Adele. <laughs> I'm going to find someone like you. I mean, it won't be long before you're immensely sad. Now, if you want to feel better, walk faster with your head up and listen to 1960s Motown from Detroit or listen to 1970s disco music. You cannot help but feel better. Motion impacts emotion. So we can learn to influence our own attitudes in great ways. But there's so many things in life we cannot influence and we cannot control. We just need to accept these for now. For the moment, we need to accept what's going on. But here's why this is so important. If I only have this much energy and I spend half of it on things that I cannot control or influence, then I've only got half of the energy I need for things I can control and influence. And most of you have friends that spend more energy on things they should just accept and move on with life, they waste all their energy on that, and therefore there's not much left for things they can control, the things they can influence. This is extremely valuable in a rapidly changing world. And here's my assignment for you. When something happens that you're not expecting, and this will happen a lot, ask yourself first, is there something here I can control? And is there something here I can influence? And try not to worry about anything else, because otherwise the worry will overwhelm us. Everything I'm gonna share with you tonight, by the way, is only my opinion. If you don't like it, it's okay with me. If you do like it, it's okay with me. The whole goal though is for not for you to like it is to get us to think aloud together. And to make it a lot more interesting, Lauda knows our CEO, you better not tell him that I spent our entire company's marketing budget on one amazing CGI. The most incredible graphic, I mean, this graphic, every major producer wants my graphic. Sam Raimi wants it, Zack Snyder wants it, Steven Spielberg, are you guys ready for that? I don't know if you're ready for this. Okay, you're ready for this. Let me show you this immense graphic. You ready? Here it is. <laughs> okay, there it is, that's it. Sorry, we don't have a very big marketing budget, so this is the whole thing right here. But this character, this little stick figure, I'd like you to take a moment and draw this figure on your paper. Draw it big enough to make some notes on it. Now, not you, Emils, you're driving, so you cannot do this. So we're gonna make sure that we have everything that we need, draw a little stick figure, something like this character here, because this is gonna represent some of the things we can work on. One of the legs here is gonna represent self-knowledge, sometimes called self-awareness. It is pretty amazing in life. We spend so much time alone, so much time alone, but we rarely spend time thinking about why am I the way I am? When something makes us feel really, really happy, we just say, I'm happy, it's great. Well, let's think for a minute, what makes me happy? If we are frightened, why am I frightened? What's going on here? It's self-awareness, knowing who you are. I didn't think anything at all about self-awareness until I went off to university. And a good friend of mine said, Dan, you should get to know the work of this author named Viktor Frankl. So I did, I read a couple of his books, I got to know about him. Viktor Frankl lived in Vienna in Austria. He was a psychologist and he was a very good one, very successful and very, very wealthy. Viktor Frankl also was Jewish. And when the Nazis came through Austria, they arrested every Jew they could find, including Frankl, his wife and his children. And they took him to what is arguably the most horrible of all the death camps, a place called Auschwitz. Very few people survived Auschwitz. 
about 93% of the people there died. Frankel nearly died himself. But remember, he was a psychologist by training, a trained psychologist. And so he became really curious. This person here is still alive, even though they're very sick. And the person that was here yesterday that was seemingly stronger gave up and died during the night. What happened? So he quietly began to ask questions and he discovered something pretty interesting. Every person that was still living had a deep, powerful reason to live. So strong, they refused to die. Now, Frankel became really interested in this and he said, I'm gonna develop my own reason to live. He didn't wanna die. But the reason that he chose to live is very simple. He said, I need to live so I can write a book about what happened here. He had good logic. If I don't survive, maybe no one will survive. So he determined to survive so he could write about the horrors of the camp and the things that happened there. When liberation happened and the Russians came and liberated the camps, Frankel was rehabilitated and he wrote an amazing book called Man's Search for Meaning. It's been translated into many languages around the world. I'm sure it's in Latvian. And in the book, he made some incredible observations, one of which really impressed me. When we are no longer able to change a situation, we are challenged to change ourselves. So much of the time in life, we cannot change the situation we're in, but we can change ourselves. And that's what self-awareness is all about. Self-awareness, self-knowledge is meaning to spend a lot of time thinking about our own reactions. When we're afraid, what makes us afraid? When we're excited, what makes us excited? Why do we feel tension in certain settings and free and easy in others? What are things that make us nervous? And can we identify triggers before those triggers explode? Self-knowledge is not easy to gain, but it's so important. Even, even Socrates said, know thyself. Now, the other leg represents what we're going to call people knowledge or people awareness. Now, I love being a student. It was fun being a student. And all of my friends were other students. It's normal. We hang out with people like us in our own age group. But what people knowledge is about is all kinds of people, people different than we are, people of different ages and different backgrounds. Now, there's a really simple way to become better at people knowledge. And all it takes is the movement of one finger to become better at this. You want to see it? You ready? One finger, you better people know. Here we go. Some version of this. Some version of turning off the phone. Now, personally, I love my phone. Oh, you're so beautiful. Mm, you're amazing. You have my life, my images, my contacts, my, mm, my view. But have you ever lost your phone? Uh -huh. I lost my phone once. I lost it twice. Once it was stolen. Horrible, evil people stole my phone. But the other time I lost it, it really was not my fault. Gravity is the reason I lost my phone. See, my phone was sitting on a shelf and when it fell, it fell into this round circular white thing with water going around in circles. And there was a bottom and a hole in the bottom and my phone, <laughs> yeah. Well, when your phone goes there, you do not go after it. So I lost my phone and I remember almost panicking, going, but my, my contacts, uh, I'm not backed up. And I finally had to say, Dan Moore, you live most of your life and these did not even exist. You're freaking out over nothing. So I took a deep breath and said, okay, I am not going to replace my phone, not immediately. And I went for a walk and it was such a cool experience. I actually saw other people. Well, actually, I saw the top of their head because most of them were walking with their phones doing this thing. I saw facial expressions. I actually saw birds that were not angry birds. That was a cool thing to discover as well. In other words, phones are brilliant. They're amazing for good human communication, but they can also be a barrier to communication. Studies have been done at the University of British Columbia and other places in which people were at dinner conversations. And in these dinner conversations, they would put the phone down on the table, even upside down. The concentration people showed each other was less when a phone was just sitting on the table. And all of us have had the experience of having a deep personal conversation and the other person's phone goes, delete, 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 delete. And they say, hold that powerful, powerful emotional thought. I'll be right with you. Oh, no way. Hang on, I'll get back to you. 
they're brilliant. But remember this, life is not meant to be lived in the glow of a monitor. Life is not about the series of status updates. And it's not about our friend count. It's about the friends we can count on. That sounds like some long-haired philosopher living in the forest, doesn't it? What if I told you that was the ex-CEO of Google? You see, people require people study, spending time with all kinds of different people. In fact, how many of you still have grandmother or grandfather still living? If you do, and Christmas is coming, so phone them and say, can I come see you at Christmas? And then make sure you bring them either some beautiful cookies or a bottle of vodka, you know, whatever you think they're gonna like better and sit down with them and have a couple of drinks and then say, hey, grandma and grandpa, when you were 21 years old, like I am now, tell me about your life. What was life like? They will give you a perspective of what it meant to live under the shadow of the Soviet Union. So completely different than anything you can ever understand. But if you understand an older generation, they're the one that produced your generation. So get to know them. Spend time with people completely different than you. People that feel differently politically. Now I know everyone in Latvia has exactly the same views politically, right? Everyone agrees on everything. Well, <laughs> maybe not so much. So spend time with someone that feels differently and try to understand their point of view. What about someone from a different race or a different religion? The more we understand people, the more we can adapt and adjust and do a good job with people. Just be an observer and a student of human nature. Here's one thing you'll learn. Sometimes when people appear to be angry, they're actually not angry. They are frightened. They're afraid, but it manifests as anger and it helps us to understand what they're doing a lot better. One of our arms here is gonna represent a trait we're gonna call flexibility. Flexibility to me is a mental state. We all have things we expect to happen. Here's a simple example. You pull out your weather app. It says Saturday is supposed to be sunny. So you make plans for doing something outside in the sun. And what always happens when it's supposed to be sunny? <laughs> starts raining and thundering. And it's like you shake your fist. It's not supposed to be raining. It's not. So but the reality is it is raining. It's very hard for us to be flexible. when We have a certain expectation. Many of us have expectations of our friends and our friends don't follow our expectation. And then we get disappointed, we get angry and frustrated. Flexibility means if something is not what I thought it was going to be, I need to accept it and move forward. Now, coming to the Baltics is a special event for me and my wife. And five years ago, this week, we were in Lithuania. The night before I had gone to bed watching American news program, and they said, tomorrow we predict America will wake up and have the first woman president of the United States, Hillary Rodham Clinton. So I went to sleep. When I woke up the next morning, guess what had happened? This happened overnight. And I woke up the next morning and I said to my wife, Maria, who's, is, is that, why is he? She said, yeah, he won. And I said, no, he didn't win. There's no way he won. Hillary Clinton won. And I had breakfast and got in the car and my colleague Kaido was driving me. So we listened to English language radio and they were saying, yes, in the surprise victory, Donald J. Trump is the next president of the United States. And I, I remember turning to my colleague, I said, Kaido, is there another English language station we can listen to? No? Okay, Kaido, I have another question. How close is Russia? Ah, I knew it, I knew it. This is fake news. They have hacked the radio. It's, it was more than one hour before what I thought was gonna happen, obviously hadn't happened before I could accept it. So I understand what it means to not be flexible. Can I give you a little exam here? Okay, look at the screen. How many black lines are on the screen? I see six, who sees six black lines? Okay, so here's your, here's your exam. Can you add five lines to that? five identical lines and make nine. You have six, add five and get nine. Nope, 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 nope. Only way I know how to do it is like this. I have six lines, I'm gonna add five identical lines and I'm gonna get nine. 
Now this puzzle is making some of you very frustrated because you're saying, oh, come on, Dan, that's not a math problem. I didn't say it was a math problem, but we make assumptions sometimes and we get in trouble. So flexibility means, might it be a math problem or might it be a design problem? Can I look at this in a different way? The only way I know how to become flexible in our attitudes is to realize when we're not being flexible. We make plans with friends. The friends don't want to do those plans. We get angry and upset. Isn't the point to spend time with our friends? So what does it matter what we do? When I'm inflexible, it makes me lose my sense of humor and life is just not much fun. So let's work on flexibility. Have somebody point out times, hey man, you're really being inflexible. And above all, just be ready for anything. Maybe don't expect very much and good things will happen. Now the twin of flexibility is resilience or adaptability. Remember, I'm going outside because it's not supposed to be raining, but oh my gosh, it's raining. It's raining, it's raining, cool. Let's go dance in the rain. Resilience is how do I adapt to a different situation than I was expecting? So let's do a little puzzle. Everybody cross your arms, cross your arms for just a second, sit back very comfortably, cross your arms. Oh yeah, yeah, you look pretty comfortable, that's good. Everybody happy? Cool. Now open your arms and now cross them again with the other arm on the top, the other arm. <laughs> okay, let's be honest. How many of you actually had to think about it? Uh, uh, let's see. Uh, uh, wait a minute. These arms don't fit. Who took my arms? Please give them back. I mean, it's just the oddest feeling. And yet the human body is supposed to be bilaterally symmetrical. Same on the right as it is on the left. But when we get a habit, when we get comfortable, it's really difficult to adjust and to change. Humans are that way. The only way I know how to become more resilient is to be in situations where we don't have any idea what to do. It is so unexpected. The wrong arm is on top every second and we figure it out, don't we? Many of you have been in a country for the first time where you do not speak the language at all or you think you speak the language and people start talking really fast. You don't understand a word they're saying, but you know what? You figured it out. And that's what resilience is about. Put yourself in situations where you have no way to know what to do. Take a deep breath, say, let's go for it, and you figure it out. We're going to need that in our futures, whatever those futures are. Now, up here is the brain box. The brain box, of course, is the center of learning, the center of thinking. But I think humans have a very unique ability, unique ability to put things into a different perspective. Perspective is really the way we look at something that's happened to us. Now, here's a question. Are humans the only animals that can learn? No, obviously not. Every animal can learn. In fact, if you have dogs or cats at home, they have already trained you, haven't they? <laughs> Proving that humans can learn. Let's suppose, for example, that I was a lion and my friend Laura and my friend uh, Renars are also lions. And so I say, hey, Laura, hey, Renars, are you guys hungry? Yeah, me too. Look over there. There's a baby deer. I'm going to go catch that baby deer and that'll be our lunch. Now, as I go over there, I'm thinking, <clears throat> this deer looks like it's going to move to the left. So I'll go there first. And of course, the deer goes to the right and it escapes into the forest. Oh, I missed the deer. So then I come back <clears throat> and I tell my friends, okay, next time I will be ready to go this way or that way. In other words, I've learned. See, all animals can learn. Perspective is different. Can you imagine if I came back and I said to my friends, if I said, hey, Nala, Simba, I mean, hey, think about it. I'm really happy I did not succeed in killing that deer. I'm really happy. First of all, it was only a baby. If I'd killed it, it would never have a chance to grow up and have its first deer beers. or would never have a chance to go on a deer date, man. And besides, I've been eating so much deer meat, the doc says my cholesterol is very high. So I got a great idea. Let's go down to Old Town. There's this really cool new vegan place. We'll have a salad and drink some Bellinis. What do you think? Now, my guess is that that's not gonna happen in too many jungles. But humans have the ability to look at something bad and find something worthwhile in it. 
humans have the ability to find and salvage goodness even out of great tragedy. That's what perspective does. Think about your own lives. You've had things happen to you that were terrible things, but over time, with a few years, and with the ability to see it from a different perspective, you saw something good actually came from that. That's what perspective is about. But the only way I know how to do this is to realize that everything in life is a process of learning, but then let's reflect on what happened. When we reflect on it, we think differently. We're able to make some decisions. And then when we decide something, we go forward and we act differently. We act differently. We learn, we reflect, we decide, and then we act. Perspective can help us do that. We can gain perspective by practicing looking at something from a different point of view. Here's a good political way to do that because politics is such a lively subject. Find a friend who feels very differently than you do and say to the friend, look, I would just like to see if I understand your point of view. I'm not gonna try to persuade you. I'm just gonna understand, try to explain to them their point of view. That's hard to do. But if you can explain someone else's point of view so that they say, yes, you understand me, now you're gonna gain a different perspective, a different point of view of what they're doing. My little figure has not turned around. You probably didn't see it, it was so quick, it just rotated quickly. What we're looking at is the backbone. The backbone holds us up straight, and by the same token, our values hold us on the path. I believe in flexibility and resilience, but the one thing we should not be flexible about are our values. Values are what we believe to be true. Things like honesty, integrity, but it's hard to act always according to our values. Most of you believe, for example, we should take care of planet earth. We should recycle. We should not waste resources. But if you've ever left a room with the lights burning, or if you ever used too much water, or if there's a recycle bin, but it was 10 meters away too far, then we know that it can be hard to live according to our values. Who's this individual? Yep. But I was at a meeting last week and a guy said, it's Morgan Freeman. <laughs> yeah, pretty much looks like him. Most everyone knows that Nelson Mandela spent many years in that small prison cell in a place called Robben Island off the coast of Cape Town, South Africa. He was there for 20 years and they offered his freedom. And he said, no, I will be the last political prisoner to get out. I will refuse the offer of freedom until everyone else is free. He waited seven additional years. And because of that, he broke the back of a racist governmental system called apartheid. He became the first democratically elected president in the history of South Africa. Are there any values that you believe in strongly enough that you would live for those? You know, it's one thing to see a picture of him in his cell. It's another thing to stand in front of the same cell, to be inside it, in our brain, and to think, how would I react? What would I do? Hopefully none of us will ever have to decide, do we believe in something strong enough to die for it? But you know what? Some of your grandparents did. Maybe some of your parents did. The only way I can figure out how to identify our values is to think hard. What do we believe in? What are we willing to act for? What are we willing to live for? What are we willing to support? Now, our person is looking at herself. This is what we call self-image. And self-image is exactly what it sounds like. It's simply the ability to see ourself and how we are. Most of us have a pretty good self-image as students. If you didn't, you would not be a student. But some of us have a very poor self-image of ourselves. for example, maybe as, as an athlete or in sports or as a musician, even as a friend. And self-image is the way that we see ourselves. We can have good self-image, bad self-image, or everything in between. But remember, we spend more time with ourselves than we do with anyone else. And so because of that, we should learn to see ourselves constructively. Enough other people will be seeking your destruction let yourself be the number one constructor out there. For example, think about all the things people have ever said to you that are hurtful. What hurt worst? What they said or the many times you repeated it over and over and over in your own mind. This is why something called self-talk is so important toward the process of getting better. 
This is a statue in the jungles of the country of Colombia. And next time you're in Cartagena, Colombia, hire a car and go roughly two hours to this little place called Basilio de San Palenque. You will find in the town square, a statue of this man who was the founder of that village. You see, he had been captured by the Spanish and sold into slavery, but he escaped and built a village with his friends. The Spanish burned the village to the ground. He came back again, built it again. They burned it to the ground again, he built it again. Eventually he was captured and he was executed, but his followers kept rebuilding the village until finally the King of Spain declared that this town will be the first free city in the Americas. Now, how did this person do this? He was just a slave. No, he wasn't. He was a prince. He was a prince. He was a leader. And he saw himself as a prince. Tremendous quote. Yes, we were enslaved, but we were not slaves. We were not slaves. It's how we see ourselves makes all the difference in the world. We improve self-image by concentrating on it, by seeing the good in ourselves, not just the bad, and by becoming better at self-talk. Now, if you come see me in the spring, I do an entire seminar on self-talk and understanding how important it is. But it's important whatever we do in life, because the fact is we are always talking to ourselves. We just need to learn how to talk to ourselves more effectively. Now, this part of the, the body, of course, this represents what we're going to call purpose. Now I get to be a philosopher for a minute. Is there a purpose for life? Well, you know what? Each person has to answer that question. But I can say this, based on a lot of years of living, people that believe their life is for a purpose, they live differently than people who don't. They just do. Now, you don't have to know what your purpose is. You don't. But to go forth every day saying, today may be one of the days that I learned about my purpose. To maybe one of the days that I move closer to my purpose in life. People that have a purpose in life also have a sense of greater energy. Now, this is interesting, isn't it? If we wake up in the morning, we say, whoa, I know that my life's important. I know my life is important. We're going to have a lot more energy than if we wake up in the morning, we think, you know what? My mother and father should have been more careful. I'm just an accident. Whew, not much energy involved in that thought, is there? It also gives us a greater sense, not just of this, but a tremendous sense of, of commitment. Commitment is very simply the muscle that just won't let us quit. Quitting is easy. Staying with something that's difficult is not easy. But commitment is essential in life, in relationships, and in success. It also gives us more of this resilience we're talking about. We can get slammed down, but when we feel there's a purpose for our life, we get up again. I get knocked down and I get up again. Ain't nothing gonna keep me down. I get knocked down. Oh, you're all too young to know that song, but it's a good one. And finally, this greater sense of what we might call joy. Joy is different than just fun. I dig fun. Fun is amazing. If you ask me, hey, Dan, what do you like to do for fun? Simple, find me a piano, a good glass of wine, and some people that don't mind singing really loud even if it's bad, that's fun. But joy is a little different. Joy is the sense that my purpose is being achieved. I'm using all my talents and skills. I'm doing my very, very best. You can be exhausted and feel joy if we know that we're doing the best that we can do. So here's our person here, all these different attributes, all these different aspects. And here's my question. When do we stop working on all these things? Well, I hope the answer is never. I hope the answer is never. We're going to always work on these because throughout our lives, we have a choice to keep growing, to become better and better, or to go backwards and get worse and worse. I hope you choose always to go forward and get better and better. So who's had some kind of fun tonight? Hopefully you have. We've been all the way to 50 years of age. We've been all the way to Mars. So let's finish by going back to where it all started. Kindergarten. Who enjoyed kindergarten? I loved kindergarten. It was the best 10 years of my whole life. <laughs> I thought it was fantastic. And a man named Robert Fulgham wrote a book once about kindergarten children. The book was called Everything I Needed to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. Now, the book made him an international celebrity. He was flown all over giving speeches, interviews, talk 
talk shows. He was amazingly popular, but he did not want to be a professional speaker. He said, I just want to write books. I just want to be quiet. Leave me alone. But the request to speak continued to fly into him. So finally he said, okay, I will speak to only two kinds of audiences. I'll speak to kindergarten children, small children, and I will speak to students in universities. And that's it. And I realized how intelligent the guy was because this meant he could go to a city and talk to the kindergarten children in the morning when they've just left their beds. And then he could talk to the university students in the evening when they've just left their beds. So he's always got a fresh audience to deal with. And he would start the same way. He would talk to the small children and say, children, I've got some questions for you. First of all, how many of you can sing? Now, if you have little people in your life and you say, can you sing? They will sing. My granddaughter, Alana, not even two and a half, I say, Alana, sing. She'll say, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. She just starts singing. She can't stop it. Can you dance? Oh, yeah, I can dance. I dance all over the room. Can you draw? You ever seen a little child with a drawing? <laughs> they'll draw a circle and say, what did you draw? And they'll say, it's a horse. Can't you see it? It's a horse. I have an apple and my mummy and a house, and I made this just for you. That's what kids do. Later that evening, Dr. Fulton would go to a university campus someplace, big school, big school, lots and lots of kids there, students there everywhere. And he would turn to the students and he would say, students, I got a question for you. How many of you can sing? And you see students kind of laughing nervously. <laughs> well, I sing, but only when I'm drunk. <laughs> but not very many hands go up. And then he would say, well, I have another question. Who can dance? Sometimes a student will say, well, I've got these AirPods. I kind of do this once in a while, you know, but no, I don't really dance, dance. Well, how many of you can draw? And a couple of architects or maybe engineers, they raise their hands and everybody else, oh no, man, I'm into texting. I don't draw. Uh -uh. Dr. Robert Fogelman would look at this audience, this crowd of students, and he would say, what happened to you? When you were five years old or six years old, you could do anything. And now you're 20, <laughs> you can't even sing, you can't even dance, and you can't even draw. Where did you go? Hmm. Well, I think we all know what happened, don't we? Sometime between being really small, like my granddaughter's age, and being bigger, we learn how to be embarrassed. We learn how to be ashamed. Children are not embarrassed about anything. Watch a baby sometime. It cries, it poops, it wets, it laughs, it eats. It's happy and proud of all of it. We get older and people say, no, don't, 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 don't. Some kinds of embarrassment are very, very good. They keep the human race moving. But young people, please don't let your concern about other people's opinions cause you to not, not pursue what you're meant to do in this life. The path you're on may be completely different than the path your parents are on, and they don't understand it one bit. But if it's your path, it's your path. And second, don't be so afraid of failure that you fail because you're afraid. I don't know anybody that is successful that has not failed multiple, multiple times. You learn from that that failure is not final. You learn from that that I can grow, that I can learn, that I'm okay. And it makes us more at peace. It makes us more joyful. It makes us better able to help other people. So I wanna thank everybody for being here tonight. I wanna to thank our sponsor. I wanna thank everybody that made this happen, the student leaders in Southwestern Advantage, and all of you that are just dropped in because you had nothing else to do tonight. <laughs> Let's pray for the end of the lockdown. We can all have a beer together one of these days, and that'll be way, way cool. So my thanks to you. Uh, Laura, I don't know if anybody has questions they wanna submit through the chat. What do you think? I can see, first of all, Cool things that them did amazing job. You can unmute yourself and uh, give a round of applause. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
Yes. All this, all this. Good things he learned a lot. And the, then I can see a couple of raised hands. Okay. I think these what? are questions, but I just missed them. I guess, uh, Nix, you raised your hand first. Are you still here? Yeah, I'm still here. I, I was uh, putting the clapping emoji on. <laughs> Oh, very cool. He's good with these emojis. We love it. <laughs> um, you. Do you have time then for a couple of questions, if anyone has? I sure do. I know you're not going anywhere tonight, so I might as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, I saw another raised questions or a raised hand. If you have questions, you, you can write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and uh, ask it. But uh, while people think I could ask them, you said about this purpose, it's kind of process while you find it. But when did that happen to you? How did you find your purpose or when did that happen? Well, that's a good question. It didn't happen in one day. That's for certain. Um, I tried different things. I did my best as a student. I got into my first job. And I thought my purpose would have something to do with helping other people achieve their potential in life. So I thought about being a teacher or being a coach or something like that. I didn't really quite know what to do, but I worked really hard and did the best I could at what I was doing. And then when I was 32 years old, after a conversation I had with my wife, I said, I am actually pursuing my purpose right now. I just didn't recognize it. That my purpose is to try to help other people achieve their potential to develop the best that they could do it really became my purpose and it has been that way for a really really long time we do our best with our children and we'll do the best with our granddaughter so that's become a really powerful thing thank you and um we have a question from renars renars do... he's yeah i can read it to you how do okay. you to the level of being so humble and wanting to provide service like you do? Well, you know, Renars, it's hard to be humble when you're perfect in every way. I can't wait to look in a mirror. I get better looking each day. To know me is to love me. I must be one hell of a man. Oh, Lord, it's hard to be humble, but I'm doing the best that I can. <laughs> that's from an old old country song it's hilarious uh renars sometimes i'm not humble sometimes i'm very proud and there's a line between being too humble where you don't believe you're capable of doing anything and being too arrogant to where you make the world worse so learning where that line is is really important humility doesn't mean you think less of yourself at all but it means you maybe you think of yourself a bit less. And when we do that, good things happens. So thanks for that question. It's a good one. Still working on it. So maybe one more if anybody has one. If not, you know the best way to get me to shut up is to just not have any more questions. <laughs> then I guess thank you so much for being uh, here. And uh, thank you, thanks Lana. everyone for being here. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, thank you, everybody. I can hardly wait to get back to Latvia. I look forward to being there in the spring, spending time with as many people as I can. So thank you. Apply these ideas. And if any of them work, tell me. I'll try them myself. <laughs> the, see you all on the next lecture on the 9th of December. Keep in mind that Facebook page. Go there and like it so you're updated. And thank you for investing in yourself this Friday night and making right choice and enjoy your weekend. Thanks everybody, good night. Good night. Thank good night. you, Dan. Thank, Thank you, you, bye. Tristan, this bye -bye. is nice. <laughs>